Hello, and welcome to My Sex Bio's Fucking Capitalism series. Uh, this is the February presentation uh, that we'll be going through. Um, just a disclaimer, my name is Pierce Delahunt. I've been teaching activism slash political education uh, since 2010. Um, and uh, I myself am a member of uh, various positions of privilege and power. Um, I want to name that up front. Um, and especially, I think what gets under named in these kinds of spaces is that I'm the facilitator, which is a position of power in this context. Um, and uh, so uh, I will be presenting on this. I am not profiting off of this uh, at all. Um, any proceeds uh, from this fucking capitalism series goes to my sex bio and their other staff. Um, naming that up front. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is the mini presentation uh, for the February month of February of fucking capitalism. Um, cool. So just to get us everyone on the same page, uh, we're going to talk about something called political economy. Um, most uh, people in the U.S. at least don't know what this is, um, which I think is a testament to our education system. Um, Political economy is just a combination of politics and economics. Uh, it says that any uh, political system is going to be tied up with an economic system, and any economic system is going to be tied up with a political system. Uh, if you have an employer and an employee, they have a contract together, and that contract is enforced by the state, and the state is going to be friendlier to uh, one group of those people, um, depending on what kind of political economy they live in. Um, that brings us to the two primary uh, superstructures of political economy, which are uh, capitalism and socialism. Um, looking at this, we see that capitalism are when the owners have control and socialism is when the workers have control. And this tension of who is in control is always playing out. They're always in a tug of war over the means of production. That is the key, is who controls the means of production is going to determine what kind of political economy we live in. A um, couple things to be clear. Uh, one is that notice in, in terms of differentiating socialism and capitalism, I haven't said anything about government. I haven't said anything about private business, right? You can have a socialist business and you can have a capitalist government. In fact, here in the United States, we do. Um, the private business versus government uh, differentiation is just a totally different thing from uh, the socialism capitalism differentiation. Um, also, uh, another thing to be clear is that this is not a an on off switch, right? It's not uh, there is socialism, and then you flip a switch. And then now the owners are in control. And now it's capitalism. It's not a binary, right? Um, you can have a lot of different degrees of power over different means of production, and those tensions are always playing out all the time, right? Um, so uh, just to be clear about that. Um, now, what are means of production? Examples include land, knowledge, materials, bodies, and labor. That's a key one, among many other things. Uh, land is really important in uh, terms of uh, a something that is uh, most often called primitive accumulation. Uh, that's just a side note for, for the, our purposes right now. The thing I wanna focus on here is labor um, because labor is uh, the means of production that uh, the working class have and none other, right? Or at least uh, the, they primarily rely on their labor. They sell their labor, that means of production. They rent out their labor in order to, uh, to receive sustenance that they can use. Um, whereas capitalists uh, or, or the bourgeoisie, the owning class, uh, they own other means of production, whether that's land or a factory like materials or, or any other kind of uh, means of production. And it's by renting out those means of production that they profit, right? So if uh, you, all you have to uh, profit from is your own labor, that is uh, part of the working class or the proletariat. And if you profit off of other means of production that you rent out to other people for them to labor, then you are a capitalist or the owning class or the bourgeoisie. Um, another important thing to note there is that um, just being pro-capitalism doesn't make you a capitalist, right? Uh, you can be a 
a uh, working class person who is pro-capitalism, um, but uh, that doesn't make you a capitalist. In order to be a capitalist, you have to be profiting off of means of production, off of other people's labor. Um, so uh, one other important distinction to make here then is the difference between personal pro property and private property, right? Personal property is not considered a means of production. So for example, the house that you live in and personally use, that's your personal property, not a means of production, not private property. Um, the house that you rent out to someone else and that you profit from, uh, that is private property and that is a means of production. So if you ever hear uh, socialists talking about seizing the means of production, right? They're not talking about the house you personally personally live in. They're not talking about your toothbrush. They're not talking about your laptop, right? They're talking about uh, the, the means of production, the private property, the capital that is used by workers to create wealth that ultimately gets uh, taken from by the capitalists, the owning class, the bourgeoisie, the owners, the work, uh, the, the bosses, uh, those people. Um, Great. Uh, moving forward from there, uh, and I want to emphasize that if this were uh, the actual discussion itself, I would you know pause and ask for questions anytime people uh, bring those up. Um, but moving forward from there, one thing that I want to emphasize for the context of my sex bio is the difference between socialist feminism and capitalist feminism. Um, we'll start with capitalist feminism. That feminism says that um, we will achieve feminism and gender equality by granting everyone access to uh, equal access to uh, climbing the corporate ladder, right? If that, as long as everyone has a fair shot of being a CEO, um, then we have equity. And if you're poor at that point, then it's your own fault. Um, and uh, my favorite way of explaining that is uh, the, a uh, pithy definition of liberalism, which says liberalism is the idea that no poor queer person of color should die just because they are queer or of color. Dot dot dot. Right. I'm not saying anything about uh, about them not dying just because they're poor. Right. Capitalism enforces that. Um, socialist feminism, on the other hand, says uh, that's not enough. Um, we need to abolish poverty itself, um, not uh, just because uh, poverty under the, the history and, and system that we currently live in will always disproportionately affect uh, historically marginal, marginalized groups, including women and queer and trans folk, um, but uh, also that if anyone were to die from poverty, that just would not be particularly feminist. Um, and so in order to abolish poverty, we must abolish private property, the means of, of uh, production in that way. Um, and so that is the socialist feminism. And so, um, you know, we will be coming at this more from that angle. Um, and, uh, and I want to name that distinction so that everyone understands. Um, so that is the uh, the political economy slide that I just want everyone to get on the same page on in terms of what we're talking about. Um, but moving forward, this month's theme is pleasure activism and the senses. Uh, so what does that mean for us? Um, I want to use that theme to jump into a particular concept that I think is really awesome to, to dig into. Um, Marx formalized this concept of alienation, and he meant something very specific with that. Uh, he was talking about this idea that we go into work and we perform labor for uh, eight hours a day, often more, um, sometimes the majority of our waking lives. And, um, and for this particular conversation, it's easier to use a manufacturing example, but it, it applies to whatever our work is, including uh, services. Um, but uh, we go into work and we make a thing um, and we we have to leave the thing that we made there, right? Um, so if we're making chairs or whatever it is, uh, we make all these chairs uh, per hour, per day, and uh, we don't get to keep them. We are alienated from the products of our labor, right? And it would be one thing if we were being adequately paid, um, but if we're, if we're getting paid $20 an hour, it is because 
we are producing more than $20 an hour worth of chairs. If that were not the case, our boss would just fire us, right? Why would our boss pay us $20 an hour if we're only making $15 an hour worth of chair, right? That's the boss losing $5 an hour. Um, and uh, so we're then not only are we not seeing the products of our labor, but we're not being paid the full, the full value of our labor. So in that, we are being alienated from our labor. And uh, that would be one thing, again, if we were working maybe two hours a day. Um, but when we're working eight hours a day or more, oftentimes the majority of our waking lives, um, then we're dedicating a lot of time and effort and energy of our own selves to something that we are alienated from. And it is that physical material reality, that material condition that uh, me means, uh, that has, is this massive force behind us being alienated from ourselves. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna name, uh, speaker presenter as Johan Hari as a really awesome uh, presenter on this kind of subject of how is this alienation from labor that is contributing to rises in depression and, and uh, all kinds of other uh, social emotional um, issues that derive from that. Um, but going into the analysis that we just presented, we're looking at the difference between materialism versus idealism. And uh, I want to be clear, we're not using these words in the colloquial sense, right? We're not talking about materialism as consumerism or idealism as like utopian thinking, um, right? We're talking about materialism as, an, as a form of analysis, one that says that it's the physical conditions that create reality, including the inner reality, versus idealism, which says that it's the inner conditions that create reality, including the physical reality. Um, and like obviously both are true, right? It is true that physical conditions create reality, including the inner, and it is true that inner conditions create reality, including the physical. Um, but the emphasis on a materialist analysis says that uh, when we are dedicating the majority of our waking lives to something that we are alienated from, um, it is, uh, there's, there's no amount of strength of will or like inner, reality that we can muster that's going to overcome that situation, right? Um, and that uh, that puts us then in the uh, in a material analysis, which Marx was uh, a big proponent of. Um, it, he often advocated looking at the uh, relations that we have to property uh, and to the means of production in order to understand the relations that we have to each other and ourselves. Um, so that is how Marx applies materialism. Um, some examples of idealism, uh, the traditional one is uh, kind of a uh, historically theological one that um, like the closer we are to God, right, the more we allow God into our hearts, um, then the more riches we will be blessed with, right? Um, and if, if we haven't been blessed with those riches, then it's because we didn't really let God enough into our hearts. Um, and uh, you'll hear, you, you will hear idealism uh, being used to justify the physical reality a lot, right? Um, whereas uh, materialism tries to explain our inner realities with, the, with the, the relations that we have to these physical conditions um, in a way to do something about them. Idealism tries to explain uh, those conditions in a way that often justifies them. Um, some uh, more modern examples of idealism. There's like a new agey idea that, uh, right, we, the law of attraction that uh, if whatever bad situation we're in, it's because we manifested it and weren't uh, thinking enough positive thoughts or thought too many negative thoughts. And we, uh, like our, our vibrations were too low, right? That kind of thinking. Um, so that's, that's often how idealism gets used. Um, in all kinds of ways to justify all kinds of things. Um, again, it's obviously true that our inner conditions create the reality, um, but they're not the only thing. And overwhelmingly, given the, the 
history and current situation that we're in. It's the material conditions uh, that determine that more than the inner conditions. Um, where does that leave us then, right? Like short of a socialist revolution, right? Which I would love to see, um, what can we do in order to uh, reclaim connection with ourselves, with our labor if possible? Um, how do we do that? Um, and uh, that, uh, my favorite practice personally for, for that is something called nonviolent communication. If you're familiar with it, maybe you have some baggage with it. I just want to name that it uh, has been weaponized and, and co-opted, just like uh, white supremacy weaponizes and co-ops everything it possibly can. Um, to uh, often, I, I see nonviolent communication being used to uh, gaslight or tone police, right? Um, but that's not uh, what we're doing here, and I would argue that's actually violent communication and just not uh, the concept of of NVC, which we're going to get into just right now. Um, we're going to open with two quotations. So one of these quotations actually comes from Marshall Rosenberg himself. He's the founder uh, of, of nonviolent communication as formalized by him. Uh, he says, people connected to their needs make very bad slaves. Uh, we're going to talk about what that means in just a moment. Um, then the other quotation, it is when we are disconnected from feelings that our strategies most suck. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Angela Watrous. She's my therapist. She's great. Um, I love that quotation. What do these quotations mean and how do they relate to nonviolent communication and anti-oppression work, right? Um, so nonviolent communication then centers needs. Um, and, uh, and it's about being connected to those needs, uh, in ourselves and in other people, um, that then that's what it means to be connected to each other and ourselves. Um, and we can get better connected to our needs by connecting better to our feelings, right? Our feelings are important messages about what our needs are. Um, if our need, if our feelings are joy, um, then that's a pretty good indicator that the needs that are most alive in us are being met. If our feelings are sadness or fear or anger, that's a pretty good indicator that the needs that are most alive in us are, um, are either not being met or uh, actively being violated. Um, and so the feelings then are really good indicators about what our needs are. Um, observations are another really good indicator um, and in observations, that includes our senses, the physical sensations that we have. Um, so that if if I know that, oh, when I see this happen, um, I feel this kind of way, or if I hear this happen, or smell or taste or touch or whatever, um, I feel this kind of way. Um, those are all really good indications about what our triggers are for good feelings or bad feelings, and uh, when our needs are being met, not met, or violated. Um, so in this way, right, um, I'm going to have a much harder time convincing you to violate your needs if you are connected to them, right? If you even just know what they are, um, if you know what the needs of your loved ones are, if you, if you at least know what your feelings are, right? Maybe you don't know what your needs are, but you say, I don't know, like I feel a little uncomfortable about that. I'm not sure why I need to think that one over or whatever, right? Um, whereas if we live in disconnected from our needs, it's going to be a lot easier to convince you to violate them, um, in, in order to, for me to profit off of, right? And the force of, of capitalism is one that alienates us from ourselves to the point that we, we don't know what our needs are. And we often don't even know what our feelings are. We often don't even know what our physical sensations are some of the time, right? Uh, it happens. Um, so that brings us when this is a dart board, right? And when we throw the dart and we hit, hit the center, we're at the needs. If we throw the dart and we're totally off center, we're off the board, we're just hitting the wall, then we're in the world of judgments, moralistic judgments, especially. And so uh, the big four judgments that I like to reference are right, wrong, good, bad, good, evil, or should, should not. And if you are disconnected from your needs, it's going to be much easier for me to convince you that violating your needs is somehow right or good, or that honoring your needs is somehow wrong or bad or evil. 
if you don't know what they are, then it puts you at a severe disadvantage of, of uh, being able to uh, navigate that. And that's what Marshall Rosenberg means when he says that uh, people connected to their needs make very bad slaves. Um, he actually called uh, like our default mode of communication, emotional slavery. And he describes nonviolent communication as a language of liberation, a language of life. Um, and it's in that, in this way too, that I want to name uh, what my therapist is talking about when she says it is when we are disconnected from feelings that our strategies most suck, because we have this idea that um, in order to uh, make good decisions, we need to be perfectly rational and perfectly not emotional, right? Um, but feelings are just clues about what our needs are. They're just information. Why would we ever want to cut ourselves off from information, especially something so valuable as uh, what our feelings are and what, and what our needs are. Um, and, uh, and we can, we can want to make a decision for all kinds of reasons. And we need to be honest with ourselves. And that means being connected to our feelings and our needs, right? Um, to highlight that, I want to talk about this idea of, uh, something called solutions privilege, uh, which, uh, the the organization Nonprofit As Fuck, a nonprofit AF dot com, uh, talks about is that um, it is when we are trying to uh, solve a situation, but we're motivated more by our own personal discomfort with something uh, that our solutions are not really going to get at the root of what the situation is. Right? Um, you can think of like white fragility, male fragility, uh, those, those kinds of things in terms of like being presented with uh, a problem around uh, race or gender and, and like now, oh, wow, I don't know what to do. I, I just want to like make this all go away, right? That's, uh, that is the kind of solution that we look for when we're not allowing ourselves to feel the discomfort. Um, but when we can lean into that feeling, uh, then and, and be comfortable with discomfort, then we can make a solution or a course of action that is, um, it's not rooted in our prioritizing our own comfort. It's, it's rooted in doing something to address the problem, right? Because now we're comfortable enough with our own discomfort that we can sit with it and we can try to figure out what other feelings and needs there are and try to figure out how to do something that doesn't prioritize us. Um, and in that way, we can better address systemic oppression and we can take more collective uh, liberation, uh, act toward more collective liberation together. Um, awesome. So uh, then just to go through some resources here, um, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the ones that are more focused on the conversation around capitalism versus socialism. Um, really good stuff there. I want to emphasize uh, the glossary comes from uh, Black Socialists of America and uh, that video from Richard Wolff. Uh, Richard Wolff is a really great speaker on the topic in general. That video is personally my favorite uh, one to start with from him. Uh, I think it gives a lot of really good mix of history and analysis and all those kinds of things together, uh, just to have a better context of all that. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have a bunch of things as related to this specific uh, month and theme and conversation. Um, we have two orgs uh, working on this specific problem. My Sex Bio is one of them. Uh, we're trying to get people connected to uh, our own feelings and the feelings of each other. And, and I think encouraging people to explore their own sexuality uh, is itself a form of pleasure activism. So that's really awesome. Uh, Trauma-informed nonviolent communication is a really awesome resource uh, uh, led by a, a person named Minachi. Uh, they do really awesome work, have uh, really good uh, resources out, including that book, Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication. Um, and they often lead workshops uh, around uh, what nonviolent communication means in a uh, context of living under white supremacy, right? Um, and uh, really good stuff there. Uh, of course, there's the book itself, Pleasure Activism, written and gathered by Adrienne Marie Brown, really good stuff. Uh, it goes into uh, sex, of course, but not just that, also drugs and rock and roll and everything else. Um, and then uh, really good stuff around pleasure activism, uh, 
especially coming from the podcast Irresistible, which I want to name. Uh, there's uh, some uh, baggage there, um, just to to not let that go unnamed. But um, that the content itself of uh, the interview about pleasure activism uh, or um, the relational somatics or somatics practice, all those things are uh, around getting us in touch with our senses uh, for the sake of collective liberation. Um, and then Johan Hari, I named him uh, around that conversation of uh, alienation. He's got one 20 minute TED talk, one hour and a half lecture, really good stuff. And then finally, uh, from Philosophy Tube, hosted by Abigail, really awesome uh, YouTube channel in general. Um, but uh, the, in particular, that uh, ASMR guided meditation, uh, it's done in a very funny way, um, but is also uh, can be sincerely used as a practice to connect ourselves with our feelings um, for the purposes of uh, collective liberation and, um, and navigating what all those complexities mean. Um, there's a lot of uh, questions that come up in that guided meditation that I think are just really valuable, even if uh, funny. Um, so that is the mini presentation for uh, February of fucking capitalism um, as presented uh, or hosted by My Sex Bio. Um, if you were in the February um, uh, actual group itself where we discuss these things, um, we would have the uh, breakout prompt for uh, the question, how has or does capitalism limit your senses and feelings, especially pleasure? Um, we would give some time to, uh, to go into breakout groups and just debrief that and discuss that. And then uh, the next question we would have is, how do you or would you like to connect or reconnect to your body? And how does that relate to capitalism? Um, and we would uh, we would discuss that question in a breakout group and then debrief it. Um, and if you're not sure uh, how your own practice relates to capitalism, um, that's something I'd be more than happy to help you with. Um, so uh, this is the February presentation um, and uh, it, the resources will be made available if you join us in our Slack. Um, the slides are always there. Um, hopefully we can uh, share this publicly uh, uh, to the world at large at some point too. Um, and uh, very grateful to be in journey with y'all on this. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention and uh, solidarity. Wish you well. Cheers.